come now to the reading and preaching of God's Word, which this morning as we continue to walk into the book of Acts, we come to Acts 15 and continue through this first council, looking this morning at verses 12 through 21. So if you have Bibles with you, I ask you to turn there in Acts the verb, chapter 15, verses 12 to 21. Using the Pew Bible, you can find this on page 924. And before we actually read God's word and hear it preach, let's go to our Lord and ask you to illumine our hearts and minds that we might rightly receive that which he has for us this morning. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we do come before you, thanking you and praising you, because you reveal yourself in a mighty way through your preached word. So Lord, as we consider this text of Scripture, as we consider this first council, Lord, as considering this issue of circumcision in the law, help us, Lord, to see that which you have for us. Help us, Lord, to understand how you're showing us our need to consider our brothers, Lord. That to live for Christ means to not live for ourselves, but to put him and others first. Lord, I ask as we hear this word preached, you might cause us, Lord, to truly understand, and not just to hear your word, but to seek to live it out. Lord, be with me, your servant. Let the words I speak be clear and concise. Let them resonate in the hearts of your people. Help me, Lord, to preach with passion, power, and persuasion, so your work might accomplish its purposes, Lord. For we ask these things in Jesus Christ, in his precious name. Amen. So Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 12. Hear now God's holy and errant and infallible word. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that is fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. Therefore, my judgment is we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations... Moses has had in every, si every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Do you ever find yourself getting mad because you just can't find enough people to serve? You're saying to yourself, if only there were more needy people around me, more people I could put before myself. All the troubles I had because there's not enough to need me. Is that a problem you have? Probably not, right? Because our problem usually is the other direction. People not serving us, not meeting our needs, not putting us first. Because what do we think? We think Christ calls us to himself so he and all his church can be there to meet our needs, lift us up, and serve everything we want. But is that really what coming to Christ means? Is that how you live your faith out? See, that's why you want to listen this morning. Because you're going to see, as we continue walking through this text and this first council... You saw last week how you're saved by grace alone. Now, Paul and Barnabas and quickly James is going to show you what that means. And they're going to show you how it means you need to consider your brothers. This means putting Christ and others before yourself. I want you to follow along to unpack our text. Four stops on the way to the message is point. Here's what you're going to see. First, God brings differences together. Second, Christ unites you. Third, don't trouble your brothers. And fourth, consider others. And this brings us to the big idea. Here's the point. Here's what you want to grab hold of and live out. Consider others, and you'll be living for Christ. So first, God brings differences together. Am I right that most of us prefer people who look, think, and act like us? You know, our family, our friends, our loved ones, the people we typically surround ourselves with. Is that who you prefer? If given the choice, if you could spend a day with relatives and people who think, act, and look just like you, or with total strangers who think, act, speak, and do things differently from you, which would you choose? Wouldn't you choose the former and not the latter? We like 
like-minded people. We don't like people who are different. But yet, what does God do in his church? He actually does just the opposite of what we prefer. Because God brings differences together. And that's what you see Paul and Barnabas getting at as they stand up to speak. Look at verse 12. Look what it says. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Barnabas and Paul are affirming just what Peter says. And they're doing so by letting this whole assembly know what God did through them as they traveled through all these Gentile lands and nations. And understand what they're doing here is they're making clear that these Gentiles weren't accepted because they were circumcised. But they were accepted because God's grace was visited upon them. God shed his grace upon them. They told the people, the Gentiles, about Christ's death and resurrection, and that's what made the difference for them. That's what converted them, not the law. And that's what they're laying out here. And you see it by when they say the signs and wonders that God did through them. They're not talking about these miracles. They're talking about how he's taking a people who are once far off outside the covenant, and God is bringing them in. That's the sign and wonder. And what did he do? He poured the Spirit out upon the Gentiles just like he did the Jews. That's what Peter was talking about last week, and that's what they're reaffirming here. And you're seeing through this, these signs and wonders, God's divine sign that's bringing two separate people groups together into one. Because that's what God does. God brings differences together. And he does this for the good of the whole church. And understand, what you're seeing in verse 12 is just a summary statement. It wasn't like they just got up and said one sentence. They talked for a while. That's why verse 13a says, after they finish speaking. The idea is that they're in a presbytery meeting or a general assembly, which means they're filled with elders and pastors. And you know what leaders like to do? They like to talk. Pastors have trouble shutting up. So that means Barnabas and Paul here, they're going for a long while talking about everything they experienced, everything they went through, how they suffered for Christ. And how do you know that? Because as you'll see in a couple weeks in verse 26, you hear about how they suffered for Christ. So they're going on and on, laying out everything that God has done, how God has done this to bring differences together. And he does this to make you better. You realize that? God brings differences together so that you are better. You're better equipped to do what? To actually consider your brothers. To actually live for others first and not yourself. See, when you get around people who are different from you, speak differently, look differently, act differently, eat differently, you know what it does? It challenges your assumptions. It causes you to actually think about where you stand and why. See, that's why most of us prefer to keep people around us that are just like us. You know where you see this at? You see this with the million and one blogs that exist. Right? There's a group for everything out there. Whatever you prefer, there's a group for it. And you know what they have in that group? Only like-minded people. Go on one of those blogs, one of those websites, and actually share a contrary view and see what happens. You're quickly ostracized. Made you feel like you don't belong. You're an idiot. Get out. You don't belong. Get away from us. But you know what that does? That misses the benefit of differences. How differences actually enhance us, make us stronger, make us better. Because it causes us to think about others first. Why they do the things they do. Why they say the things they say. Why they think the things they think. You ever have to stop and explain your position and suddenly realize you don't know why you think what you think? It's only what you were taught and you never really understood it? That's what happens when you're around differences. That's how you get enhanced and God grows you. That's why you want to embrace differences and not resist them. Understanding that God brings differences together so you can grow in your faith. You better understand what it means to live out Jesus Christ. You understand you're saved by the gospel, but what does that mean? It means you're brought together different people. Because that's what God does. Brings you out of your comfort zone so that you suddenly have to be around those who are different from you. And you've got to consider their. So this is why God brings differences together. And how does he do it? He does it through his son, Jesus Christ, which brings us to our second point. Christ unites you. You see, Barnabas and Paul going along with this long speech on how God worked through them to convert the Gentiles. How God used them in the words they spoke to give them the sign of inclusion. These signs and wonders that said, you're included. You are among the Jews. 
So you had Peter speak and lay out how you're saved by grace, how the Spirit was poured out, and Barnabas and Paul now stand up and say, look, we can confirm it because we saw it firsthand. We saw what God did. And then they sit down so another can stand and speak. And this time, it's the moderator of the assembly. It's James himself. James, who's a leader in the church, one who's known for his pious and righteous living, one who has a proper lifestyle, one who, quite frankly, is the brother of Jesus who rejected Jesus when he lived in the middle earth. He said, what do you mean you're God? You're a fool. But what happened after Jesus Christ's death and resurrection? James was converted. His eyes were opened. He saw that Christ died so he might live. And he was converted. And you see that in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. But he's not just one who was converted. He's also a fellow Jew. Galatians 2, 12 tells you that James is the party that these Judaizers came from. So what are you seeing here? He's not just the moderator, but he's one of the own. Think about what you have here. What's the issue before us? Do you need to be circumcised to be saved? Do these Gentiles have to follow the Mosaic law? And who's standing up to speak now? One of their own. This is not an outsider. It's not a Gentile. This is a Jew through and through. This is James. And what does he do? He begins by referring to those in assembly through his connection. That's why the first word he says is brothers. Look at verse 13. James replied, brothers, listen to me. You see what he's saying right here? He's saying, I'm like you. I'm one of you. Listen to what I have to tell you. And you see the respect that he's been given, and you see the authority he has, because people, when he says, listen to me, they actually listen. Everything stops. There's no side conversations going on. People aren't pulling out their phones and checking their emails. They're giving Peter, or they're giving James, their undivided attention. Because when he stands up and says, listen to me, they know he's the one who speaks with authority. So they listen. They hear what he has to say. See, this is sort of like when you hear dad say, you ever see your kids fighting over cleaning up their room or doing something you told them to do? And they say, you got to do this, you have to do that. And nobody listens, right? But what happens when they say, dad says? Then what happens? Now people listen, right? It's kind of like when your boss tells you, here's how you should go about this project. You don't know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. This is the big guy. This is the guy that's in charge. So you give careful attention to his words, what he's saying. And that's what's going on here with James, because he's the moderate. He's a leader in the church. And he's going to tell them what he thinks they need to do with the Gentiles, who God has brought in together with the Jews. How do we consider them, and how should they consider us? This is the same thing that Peter's speaking about that James is now doing. But James is doing it in a way that shows how Christ unites you, not the law. And James is doing it in a way that's a bit wiser and comes with a different way of authority. Because what was Peter doing? He was saying, I saw the Spirit poured out on them. I spoke, and this is what happened, what God said was going to happen. And James is going to do something different. He's going to let this audience know that he speaks as one of them one of their own, and he's going to go to God's word. Look at verse 14. Look what he does here. Simeon's related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. You see his wisdom there? You see what James just did? Notice how he refers to Peter, not by his Gentile name, but by his Hebrew name. He's telling this assembly, this guy, Peter, no. He says, Simeon, one of your own, one of your brothers, has relayed to you what God did through him among the Gentiles. This is designed to put the whole assembly at ease. Remember, this is a tense situation here. They want to know, what do we do with these outsiders that God is bringing in? Can we just accept them as our own? Or must we say they have to be circumcised? The walls that have to happen. What do we do with these brothers of ours? And James is making clear, I'm one of your brothers. I'm one of you. He's putting them at ease. This is kind of like Mark Antony in the Shakespearean play Julius Caesar. Where he stands up and says, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear. This is like a modern politician saying, my fellow Americans. What does that say to you? I'm one of you. Isn't it always easier to hear from somebody who stands on your side, who you know is your friend and not your enemy? You think they're going to tell you what you want to hear, right? Because they're one of you. Is that what James does, though? 
No, what does he do? He tells them just what Peter told them, just what Barnabas and Paul told them. That God has united two separate groups together through Jesus Christ, the Gentiles have been united to the Jews. That's what's going on. And he's saying that God did this because he's elected them. Those outsiders, he's elected for salvation. See, that's what he's using. He's using election language. That's why he says, again, look at the language he uses in verse 14. God visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. You see what he's saying there? This drives home how Christ unites you. Because God visited the Gentiles. It was God's initiative. He went to them. And what was the purpose of doing so? To take from them a people for his name. This is basically showing how God works. And what James is doing is so clear and so concise and so clever here is he's taking a Hebraic idiom, a people for his name, a people that typically refers to Israel, and he's applying it not to Israel, but to the Gentiles. You see what he's saying with that? That God has taken these outsiders and brought them in. He's united them to Jesus Christ just like he did you. And it wasn't through the law, but it was through his grace. God has elected the Gentiles to be part of Israel. That's what James is conveying here. He's showing how it's the spirit brought union that makes the difference. So as you think about your brothers, think about just that, James is saying. They're your brothers. These are not outsiders or strangers that you don't want to be around. These are your people because they're God's people. These are the people who were changed the same way you were by hearing about Christ, how he lived a life of perfect obedience and went to the cross to die as that perfect atoning sacrifice. See, that's what changes hearts. That's what saves souls. And anyone who's been changed now belongs to God's family because Christ unites you. And he does it through the spirit brought you. And what's so amazing about what James is doing here, and you see his wisdom is, he doesn't just say, take my word for it, but he says, this is what God always said he was going to do. Look at verse 15. Look what he says here. And with this, the prophets agree. See what he just did? He said, don't just take Peter's word for it. Don't just trust what Barnabas and Paul are telling you. Don't just trust what I'm telling you. But look at God's own words. God's prophets always told you that this is what God was going to do. He was going to bring different groups together, bring you brothers from strangers by uniting you through Jesus Christ. God's plan always included bringing Jew and Gentile together. And you see it there in the prophets. Because what is this speaking of? This is speaking of unity through diversity. The Jews should be surprised at what they're seeing because the prophets told them about this long ago. Their forefathers heard this. They see this every week in the synagogue. They're hearing these things. And James is now saying, this is what it means. What you're seeing is what God said he was going to do. And this is why you want to understand what Christ came to do. Jesus Christ came to break down that dividing wall of hostility. Broke it down so the Gentiles are no longer left outside the temple, but could now come into the presence of God, just like his people. Why? Because God chose them for himself to be his people. And this is why you don't want to let differences make you hostile towards your brothers, but you want to consider others. Make them a priority. You want to consider your brothers, because Christ has called them just as he's called you. You realize that? Christ calls you to himself, and he does that with his people throughout the world. And you're all needed. You get that? Every one of you is needed in Christ's family. Think of it like building a house. Just look around the sanctuary. What do you see? You see walls and windows, floors and ceilings. They're all needed, right? Could you imagine building a house with just walls and floors, no windows or ceilings? How would that work? It'd be inadequate, right? It's the same way if you try to have a church without differences. It's inadequate. It's not sufficient. There's something lacking. 
because you need everyone. That's why God built his house, his people, or his church by adding Gentiles into Jews because all are needed. Everyone serves a vital purpose, and that's why you are needed. That's why you need to be asking yourself, how am I serving Christ today? Am I just a spectator, or am I an active participant? Am I part of the building process that God's doing, or am I just standing outside? Because God is making clear, each and every one of you matters. That's why he called you to himself. That's why he builds his church from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Because we need one another. We need differences. And what does he do? James goes again to the prophets. And where does he go? To Amos 9, 11 to 12. Chapter 9, verses 11 to 12. Why does he go there? Because this is restoration language. Look at verses 15b and 16. Here's what it says. As it is written, after this I'll return, and I'll rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I'll rebuild its ruins, and I'll restore it. See those words, as it is written? That's prophetic introductory language, saying this is what God's always said is going to take place. This is what the prophets held out before you. It's what God made clear. And now you're seeing it. You're seeing that Israel was going to fall. It was going to go into captivity. It was going to be broken and defeated, but not done. Why? Because God had a plan. And it was to rebuild David's house, to restore Israel. And how's he going to do that? By girding it up, making it better, by bringing in the Gentiles who were once outside. Bringing Gentile and Jew together into one as Christ unites you to himself to bring differences together. And what this means is that through Jesus Christ, David's house will be restored. I mean, why did Christ come? To, again, to break down a dividing wall of hostility. How did he do it? By dying on the cross. What happened when he died on the cross? The curtain was ripped asunder. Why? Because it's showing the presence to God was opened up. You know how you find God? Not through the law, but through Jesus Christ. He's the one who unites you to himself so that you can have access to God. That's how God restores his church, rebuilds his kingdom, by bringing all his people in, Jew and Gentile alike. And that's what you're getting at in verse 17, where Amos continues. The remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles that are called by my name. You see how God's restoring his kingdom? By making all of mankind, all the remnant, come. And all the Gentiles, which Gentiles? Those who are called by my name. You see there, that's election language. That's saying that's God's predetermination. He knows who belongs to him and he calls them in. And that means, who are we to say others don't belong? If Christ says they're part of his family, guess what that means? They're your brothers and sisters. And that's why you need to consider others. Because that's what Christ does. He considers how the Gentiles also were lost and needed to be saved. Just like the Jews. So he went to the cross to die. So they might live. And see, through this again, what you see is how God's sovereign hand built his church. Calls you to himself. It's his sovereign choice. And he does this to fulfill his salvific plan of rebuilding his church. And how does he do it? Through differences. So you can know what it's like to consider others. And he does this to make you better. Because it's in the midst of differences that you actually have to focus on others. I mean, think about what he does in marriage. Doesn't he take men and women who are completely different? I mean, you can look at men and women and see they're different, right? You ever talk to women and men and see how they talk differently, talk about different things, have different focuses? But what happens when they get married? Isn't each made better? Doesn't the one complete the other? Alone or incomplete, but together they're made one. And it's the same thing in Christ's church. He takes two people, Jew and Gentile, who alone are no good, but brought together, they're made better. And Christ's church is made complete. And that's why the differences don't divide. You see that in marriage, right? Differences don't divide. But what happens? Husbands and wives do what? They consider the other's needs, not just their own. They don't say, listen, I want you to marry me so you can meet all my needs and serve me all the time, right? What do you do in marriage vows? Do you, is that what you say? I promise to marry you as long as you always cater to me, meet my needs, and give me everything I want? No. You say in sickness or health, better or worse, richer or poorer. 
right? It's through those times, through considering others, that the marriage is made better. And it's the same way in Christ's church. And the thing is, this is always the way it's been. That's why the words of Amos end, as you see in verse 18, known from old. This language, known from old, drives home, while you have a new people, you've got the same old plan. See, this is God's plan from day one, always the same, to bring Jew and Greek alike under the shed blood of Christ, to purify and cleanse them through his one mediator, his one redeemer, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross to die so you might live. And this language here is alluding to Isaiah 45, 21, which speaks of how it's God alone who's righteous and the one to whom you must turn if you're going to be saved. See, Isaiah 45, 21 is laying out the righteousness of God, which is drawing you where? To Jesus Christ. Because it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that's imputed to you that makes you better. It's what cleans you up and you know, purifies you. You're justified, not by your works, but by the person and work of Jesus Christ that's imputed to you so you might walk with him. That's what you're seeing right here. The righteousness of Christ being imputed to his elect so you might be justified and made clean. That's why you can live in harmony with others who are different. That's why Jew and Gentile can come together. Because they've all been cleansed by the blood of Christ that was shed at the cross. That's how you're united to Jesus Christ. Christ died so the two might be made one. That's what he's showing. This is how Christ unites you. And because he does so, because you're united, you need to actually think about your brothers. Which brings us to our third point. Don't trouble your brothers. James shows us clearly how it's through Christ's union that people are brought together under one roof, brought into the one family of God. He agrees with everyone who's spoken so far that you're saved by grace alone, that the gospel's enough, and he makes this clear, but then he concludes to say what this means for you. How you live this out. Because remember what the situation is. Don't lose sight of what's going on here in this assembly. We've got these Gentiles who live differently from the Jews. So what do we do? How do we live together as one? As one body of Christ? And what does he say? Don't add unnecessary burdens on them. Don't weigh them down with the law that you yourselves could not follow. That your forefathers couldn't adhere to. That's not the answer. That's not the solution. But rather, he's saying... Don't follow the Judaizers, but follow Jesus Christ, who does what? Doesn't add burden to you, but takes your burden and makes it light. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. So it's the idea of not weighing your brothers down, but lifting them up. You know how we do this? You see this all the time in life. Think about the woman who drops out of high school. So what does she do? Her whole focus is her daughter going to college and succeeding. Putting all the focus and attention there. Well, think about the guy who was the high school football star, but that was it. So what does he do? He focuses his son's attention and devotion on football so he can become a professional. You see what he's got going on there? The focus on the wrong things in the wrong places. Because these things might be wonderful. A college degree might do wonderful things for you, but it's not going to do anything when you stand before God for judgment. For that, you need to rely on Jesus Christ and him alone. And that's what James is showing. When you focus on the wrong things, when you try to look at the law for what makes you safe, what secures you, what brings you salvation, then you're basically just putting burdens on people. You're troubling your brothers. Because you're adding to them a weight that they cannot carry. That's why you want to show them Jesus Christ, who takes that weight for them. See, what you do when you insist on the law is you just weigh others down. So don't insist on the law, but point yourself and everyone around you to Jesus Christ as the one who did what? Fulfilled the law for you. Walk in perfect obedience so you might be justified through his righteousness, which again is imputed to his elect. That's the idea. See, when you make someone stand, their Christian profession being judged by what they do, what you're doing is... You're adding a burden. And you're thinking and saying, this is what matters most. But what matters most, what is key, is not what you do, but what Christ has done. 
That's what James is getting here. And that's why he's saying, don't trouble your brothers. Look at verse 19. Look what he says here. Therefore, my judgment is we shouldn't trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. The therefore shows you that James is wrapping up. This is his conclusion. He's just laid out all the theology, and now he's going to answer this question. Do Gentiles need to obey the Mosaic law? Do they need to be circumcised to be saved? And this language, we shouldn't trouble them, is a resounding no. Why would we trouble them with the law? And notice what he says. Gentiles who've turned to God. He's speaking of believers. So what is he driving home? These are people who've been saved by Christ. So why are we not trying to try to add the law to them? What is the value of adding the law to the finished work of Christ? That just gives you added burdens. That's what he's saying. They've been saved, and there's nothing more for them to do because Christ has done it all. And where do you see that? You see it clearly with Christ hanging on the cross. And what does he say? Come back, there's more to do? No, he says, it is finished. It is done. Because as he breathed his last, he was paying the price for your sin debt, purchasing your pardon, and telling you that all you needed to do has been completed. That's why it's Jesus and not your works that makes the difference. But notice the subtle distinction that James is now making. Because he's going to say, don't trouble your brothers. Don't add to grace because grace alone is sufficient. But it doesn't mean that because you're saved by grace alone, you can live just however you want. Notice what he does. He throws a word in here, that word but, because he's going to show there's going to be something else coming on here. See, Christ frees you from the burdens of the law, frees you from your enslavement, sets you free from your chains, but it doesn't mean you can just live however you want. He calls you to consider how you live this faith out. And you're going to do so in a way that doesn't cause your brother's trouble. That's why we all need to hear James say, don't trouble your brothers. But we also need to understand that this is just the negative side of what you're to do. You're not to trouble your brothers, but there is still something you need to do. Which brings us to our fourth and final point. Consider others. See, it's one thing not to put these unfair burdens on other believers. Not to weigh them down with the wall. But it's another thing entirely to conscientiously and intentionally live in a way that puts others before yourself. That puts them first. See, because that's what it means to live the freedom of your faith. To live for Christ in a way that intentionally seeks to not offend your brothers. To put others first. See, that's what James is saying that Gentiles should be doing. He says, let's not weigh them down with the law, but let's tell them to do these things. He's making clear that none of us can live however we want. Christ doesn't set us free from the law to ourselves. He sets us free from the law to live for him. And what does he show us? The great command, love God first. And what's the second great command? To love your neighbor as yourself. So James is now going to get at what that looks like, how you do that. Because he understands that this is hard. Isn't it hard to put others before yourself, to not think of yourself first, to not think that everyone else is here to serve you? Particularly when you're in the midst of differences and people start thinking and doing things differently than you would. That's why he's showing us you need to live your faith in a way that considers others. Look at verse 20. Notice how it begins. But we should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. There you got it. You got your list. You know what you need to do, right? Clear as day, right? No, this is kind of confusing, isn't it? You look at this list and you think, what is going on here? That's why when you pick up commentators and you read them, they're all over the map. Because this is a difficult passage. What does he mean by these sort of things? And one view is, they say that what's going on is the Gentiles are so different from the Jews, and God's bringing them together, but don't expect too much too quick. You need to kind of ease into the situation. Learn how to live with one another before you're really married. This is the idea, don't just expect to get married and figure out marriage, live with one another first. Does that make any sense? Of course not. That's contrary to God's word. 
God unites by bringing you together when he unites you to Jesus Christ. You don't need to figure it out. He brings you together because he does it. The other view, on the other extreme, is what they're saying is, look, Gentiles, you don't need to be Jewish, but you also can't be pagan anymore. you got to take a clean break from all you once did. Eat differently and stop practicing sexual immorality. Does that make sense? You think they don't already know this? You think they don't already know that there's certain things you do and don't do? You think they got to be told, don't fornicate, don't, commit an, don't have an affair, don't commit adultery? That doesn't make any sense. What's going on here is neither one of those extremes. What's going on here is the idea of God bringing differences together, and you need to live it out by considering others. Because what you're seeing these things all refer to is basically not just pagan practices, but pagan idolatrous worship. What you're seeing spelled out here is what, again, you see back in the prophets in the Old Testament, and you see it clearly in Numbers 25, 1 through 9. What's going on there in Numbers 25? This is where God has called his people into the promised land, and his nations around him, he says, what? Don't intermarry, don't commingle with them. And the Moabites see how big and numerous the Israelites are becoming, and they get concerned. So what do they do? They send out their best-dressed ladies and say, hey, guys, why don't you come over for a meal? Just have dinner with us. And next thing you know, they're engaging in idolatrous worship, sacrificing animals and doing what? Number 25 tells you, pouring with the Moabites, engaging in proper sexual relations. <clears throat> That's what's in view here. The idea of not being sucked in by trying to follow the law, but actually considering others so you live in a way that doesn't offend your brother. Because think about what's going on here. And Numbers 25, 24,000 people died as a result of this. The Jews are keenly familiar with this. And you know what goes on today? In this ancient text right here, you've got the same thing going on. These Moabite practices, this temple worship's going on, so they're killing animals by strangling them and drinking the blood. Why do they drink the blood? Because the power's in the blood. That's how you get power if you do that. But as good business people, what do they do with the leftover meat? They sell it at this kind of price outside the temple. So you want a nice cut of steak? You can buy it at the temple. And that's what's going on. But think about if you were a Jew, seeing somebody eating this food that was sacrificed to an idol. It might give you a heart attack. Give you convulsions. So James is saying you need to consider your brothers. You don't have to become Jewish, but you've got to consider their history as well. You need to think about what other people go through. James is making clear. Living for Christ means considering others. How do you see this? By the way our text ends in verse 21. Look what it says. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him. For he has read every Sabbath in the synagogue. The four here is providing the rationale for James' conclusion. The therefore is the conclusion, and the four is now the rationale why we shouldn't trouble them with the law, but also tell them they need to consider their brothers, consider others. It's showing the basis for avoiding these four things has to do with not offending the Jewish brothers that they're now in union with. James is not saying you have to follow dietary laws. Because if he's not saying that, because here's what I would be saying. If he was saying that, he'd be saying, no to circumcision, no to Mosaic law, but yes to dietary restrictions. Would that make any sense? Of course not. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, you need to think about your brothers. You need to consider others. And really what he's doing here is no different than what you see Paul doing in 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14. What's the situation there? The exact same thing. People eating food, meat, that's been offered to idols. And what does Paul say? Look, there's nothing wrong with eating meat. That's okay to do. But if it causes your brother to sin, then don't do it. Think about how that applies in our lives. Aren't there people in the church, Christians, who hold the position, alcohol is evil, you can't drink it? There's people who think meat is bad, you shouldn't eat it, you should be a vegetarian. So what is Paul, or what is James saying here, like Paul is saying? That within the church you need to consider others. So what that means is, if you're okay with drinking beer and eating a burger, if you're around someone who's not, then don't do it. Have a salad and drink a glass of water instead. 
It's okay to do that. It's okay to consider others. That's how you live your faith out. That's how you bring unity in the midst of diversity. By not putting yourself first, not insisting on your way, but actually being willing to hear others what they have to say and do what doesn't offend them. I mean, think about it. This is how you fulfill that law to love your neighbor as yourself. Do you show love by saying, care for me, care to me, give me all my needs? No. And you see it clearly in what Christ did. Christ went to the cross not considering himself, but considering you, your need, your great debt. So if he can die so you might live, then clearly you can pass over a beer, a hamburger, or even wearing wool, if that what it takes to not offend your brothers or sisters in Christ. You need to hear James say, consider others. See, our passage is making clear, it's building off of what we saw last week, how you're saved by grace alone, but that doesn't mean you can live however you want. Because you're not called to yourself, but you're called to a covenantal community. You've got brothers and sisters around you. So you're commanded to live for Christ by making him number one and others number two, which means you become last. So don't burden others with extra biblical or non-biblical commands, rules, or regulations. What we all need to do is ask ourselves, what I'm doing, is this helping or hurting my brother or sister? And if you find it's not helping but hurting, then maybe you need to stop doing it. Even if it's okay to do. See, that's what James and Paul make clear. There's things that are permissible to do, but it doesn't mean you should do that. Because it might hurt another. And this is not easy to do. That's why we need Jesus Christ. That's why we need to be founded on Him and His Word. Because apart from your spirit growing union, you will never consider anyone other than yourself. But yet, that's what you need to do in your Christian life. You need to consider others. Now let me end by telling you the story of Sam. Sam is this guy who's an unbeliever. His wife's a Christian. And her and her church have been praying for Sam to come to church for months, even years. And one day, Sam comes to church. But what happens? Sam forgets to turn off his cell phone. And right in the middle of the pastor's sermon, it rings. The pastor immediately stops his sermon and reminds the congregation, please turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate. Everyone in the congregation immediately shamefully and scornfully stares at Sam. How dare he? His wife on the ride home berates him about how embarrassed she was that he was in church with his phone ringing. Sam was so shaken by the event that after dropping his wife off at home, he went off to the local bar. And still shaking, he ordered beer, knocked it off the table, and just shattered the glass shattered. What happened? The waitress came over and said, no big deal, accidents happen. The janitor came over and said, are you okay? And immediately cleaned up the mess. The bartender said, no sweat, it's on me. Next one's on the house. Think about Sam and his circumstances and situations. Where do you think you find Sam every Sunday today? You know where at? Not in the church, but at the bar. So you need to ask yourself, where are you at with the Sam in your life? Are you shamefully scorning his lack of perfection, not measuring up to what you think he should do? Or are you selflessly serving, considering him before yourself? See, this is a question we all need to ask ourselves. Because the reality is this. The law and extra biblical commands and requirements, all they do is weigh people down and they're destructive to faith. But when you truly consider others, put them first, live for Christ, you actually help people to see the love of Christ and what that means. So ask yourself this question. As you consider the world around you and how you live, your brothers and sisters... Are you one who shamefully scorns or selflessly serves? And as you think about that, grab hold of this and don't let this go. Consider others and you'll be living for Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we do come before you, thanking you and praising you that you show us in this text of Scripture, Lord, how we're not here for ourselves, but we're called to live for others, to consider our brothers and so help us to do just that, Lord, to consider our words and our actions and what they convey. Help us always, Lord, to be showing the love of Christ, to be shedding grace upon all around us, Lord. Help us not to be grace for us and law for everyone else, Lord, but rather grace for all. Because, Lord, we know it's through your grace that people are drawn to yourself. So we ask, Lord, that we do just that through us, Lord. Help us to live in a way that truly considers our brothers. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's powerful name. Amen.
Let's 